Father, come by your Spirit. Pour upon us that same power that raised Christ from the dead, that you may renew faith, you may reveal faith, you may inspire our faith today as we gather in this place. Come, Lord Jesus, and reign again. Let us see your glory and yours alone as we worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, our wounded, risen Savior. Amen. Would you stand? Without hope, without light.
Till the stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered that And the dead rose from their tombs Welcome all those who've joined us now throughout the world on television. Welcome to the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem for this celebration of the risen Lord. We're going to join in some acclamations now that we want the whole world to hear. So please respond with the words in bold. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I couldn't hear you. We need to hear that louder. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. For alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Hallelujah. We want to sing a song that has been a tradition for us here at the Garden Tomb for, well, at least since I've been doing this for 16 years, if not longer. And it speaks of that glorious morning. So we'll, go ahead, guys. Join with us as we sing the resurrection hymn.
muted for our first reading. And following this, another song should be sung, Graves into Gardens. And we'll remain seated for that song. And then there'll be another reading, and then Nikki will speak. Thank you. A short reading from John 19. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. about in this season it turns graves into gardens it turns seas into highways it turns bones into armies that is the God we serve amen he raised his son Jesus from the grave
first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. The Lord is risen. Yes. You might have noticed, some of you, that I have um, these bandages on my hands. It's not that I'm trying to identify with the authentic Easter. Actually, I had a, an argument with a Shah panel and the Shah won. But Pippa reminded me this morning that even the risen Jesus had scars on his hands. And that means two things. Number one, it really was him. And number two, it means that God can take even the most painful and difficult days in our lives and turn them for good through the resurrection. That's the good news of today. On Easter day, Jesus bore, he turned on Easter Sunday, he turned the scars of shame into marks of glory. And it's a huge privilege to be here. Pippa and I are so excited to be here in Jerusalem on this day, in this special and, and actually unique place in the world, to be in Jerusalem, in the garden tomb. It's said that the history of Jerusalem is the history of the world. And Jerusalem was once regarded actually as the center of the world. It's the only city to exist twice, once in heaven and once on earth. The Abrahamic religions were born here and the world will end here on the day of judgment. And today we are at the epicenter where the central events in the history of the earth took place. Professor C.E.M. -E Jode was a, an intellectual, one of the great intellectuals of the 20th century. And he was an academic, he was a professor, a lecturer, and also a broadcaster. And he used to go on these panels, which I, if you come from England, you would think, recognize things like question time, where you have five people on a panel, you ask various questions, and often the last question is a kind of more interesting one. And the last question on the panel one time was, if you could meet one person in history and ask them one question, who would you want to meet and what would your question be? And Professor Jode replied without hesitation, this was a man who was an ardent atheist. He had spent all of his life arguing against Christianity. And his answer was, I would want to meet Jesus Christ 
and ask him, did you or did you not rise from the dead? He said, that is the most important question in the world. Later in his life, he looked at the evidence and he came to the conclusion, Jesus did rise from the dead. And he wrote a book of the evidence. What was the evidence that convinced Professor Jode that Jesus really did rise from the dead? Well, here is the first thing. And perhaps today, the most significant. It's right over there. Right over there is a visual aid. It's either the tomb from which Jesus Jesus was raised, or it's one very like it. And the tomb was empty. Or at least it wasn't entirely empty. There was something in the tomb that convinced the disciples that Jesus had risen. When they got to the tomb, as we've just read, what did they find? They ran. Mary saw that the tomb was empty. And she went to tell, the other, it was to tell Peter and John. And I, I love the fact, and this is again good evidence, that the first person who Jesus appeared to is a woman. But, yeah. <laughs> It's good for a number of reasons. But one reason is they wouldn't have made it up. Because in those days, women as witnesses were were not considered to be good witnesses. But isn't it interesting that Jesus chose a woman? He chose Mary of Magdala. Someone had had seven demons cast out of her. And someone who, who had gone around with Jesus, supporting him out of her wealth. And... She was there at the crucifixion, and she was the first witness to the resurrection. Why? why? At the crucifixion, all the men fled, and the women stayed. Why was that? Well, some say, well, the women were less likely to get arrested. But maybe they were more courageous. But here was Mary, and she runs when she sees that the body of Jesus is not there. She runs to tell Peter and John. And I love this story because Peter and John, I'm a competitive person. And you can see that John, who describes himself as the other disciple, that's the only modesty about John in this account. He's the other disciple. But he says, they started for the tomb. And John is very keen to point out that he outran Peter. He got there first, and then he waited for Peter to arrive, but then he points out again the other disciple, who was the one who had arrived first. He was the fastest, and Peter went in. Peter looked at the the tomb, but then it was John who went in, and when he saw the evidence, he saw and believed. What did he see? He saw that the tomb was not empty. The grave clothes were still there. If robbers had taken the body, they would have taken the grave clothes. But what was left was the one valuable thing. The grave clothes had collapsed like a caterpillar's cocoon when the butterflies emerged. And the headpiece had been folded up and put in another place. And then John knew that Jesus was risen from the dead. Second piece of evidence, the appearances to the disciples. And it starts with Mary. I love this account. Just beyond the reading that we had, it says that then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. I was amused to hear uh, 
a man whose name is uh, Dick, just trying to remember what his name is, Dick, Dick Griffin. He is the, the Queen's protection officer. Uh, for the last 14 years, he was known as the, the Queen's police officer. He was the one who, who went, accompanied her wherever she went for the last 14 years of her, of her life. And the Queen used to go to Balmoral for just a break on her, on her own to get away from it all. But she always went with her protection officer, Dick Griffin. And they would go out to have a picnic lunch. And this is in Balmoral in Scotland. It, it's pretty deserted. They'd have a picnic lunch and then they'd go for a little walk. And very occasionally, they would bump into hikers out for a walk. And the Queen would always say hello. One time, she was, uh, they'd had their picnic, they were going for a nice little walk, and two American tourists were hiking. And it was clear that when the Queen said hello, they didn't recognize her. And uh, they asked, uh, uh, oh, hello, where, where, where do you uh, live? And she said, well, actually, I, I live in London, but I have a home just over the, the hill there. And uh, I said, oh, so uh, how long have you been coming here? She said, oh, I've been coming here since I was a little girl, uh, over 80 years. And their sort of minds were clicking. They said, wow, if you've been coming here for 80 years, you must have met the Queen. <laughs> so she said, no, I haven't met the Queen, but Dick here meets with the Queen regularly. <laughs> so they were, they, were, they were really impressed. They, they turned to, 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 to him and said, oh, really? What's she like? And he knew that the Queen had a good sense of humor. So she said, oh, she can be rather cantankerous at times. <laughs> but she has a good sense of humor. So, so the next thing he knew was one of them had their arm around his shoulder, was taking him away and saying, could we have a photo with you? And then they got out their camera and handed it to the Queen. <laughs> and the Queen took a photo of them together. And then they swapped round and they took a picture with the Queen. And the Queen didn't say anything. But she did say, at the end of it, she said, I would love to be a fly on the wall when they get back to America and show their friends the photos. And hopefully someone realizes who I am. And here was Mary, she didn't realize who Jesus was until Jesus said her name, Mary. And maybe there's someone here today, you're not quite sure who Jesus is. You don't really recognize him. But today, he's saying your name. He's calling you. He's brought you here for a purpose. You're not here by chance. And you have an opportunity to encounter him today in the way that Mary did in the garden that first Easter day. So it wasn't just Mary. Then Jesus met with the 10 disciples and spoke to them and then, then uh, to Thomas who was doubting and he showed them the marks on his hands and the scars in his feet. And then, then he cooked them breakfast. Uh, then on one occasion he ate some broiled fish with them. Sometimes people say, oh, maybe they were imagining it. Maybe they, they kind of saw a ghost. Ghosts do not eat broiled fish. <laughs> it was Jesus They'd seen, they saw his scars. They knew it was Jesus who was raised from the dead that first Easter morning. He appeared to them, appeared to over 500 others. On one occasion, a doctor friend of mine said, that it, medically, that is impossible that 500 people have the same hallucination. And Paul writes, you can ask them. They're still alive, most of them. Go and ask them if you don't believe it. Sec that was the second piece of evidence. First, the absence of the body from the tomb. Second, the appearances to the disciples. The, the transformation. Look at the transformation in John and Peter. Here they were running away at the time of the cross. And then they spent the rest of their lives telling people, Jesus really is alive. 
It's unthinkable that if, as some have suggested, the disciples stole the body, that they would have been crucified. Peter was crucified upside down. All he had to say was, no, 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 I don't really believe it. But he didn't say that because he knew it was true. Because they had not stolen the body, they had encountered the risen Jesus. And the fourth piece of evidence is the birth and growth of the Christian church. You know, there were other people around at the time who claimed to be the Messiah. But they were killed off by the Romans and we never heard of them since. But not Jesus. Here we are. 1,990 years later. And still hundreds of us gather today to celebrate the resurrection. Joining together with 2,400 million people around the world who all believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. And the interesting thing, someone pointed this out, uh, uh, a, a theologian, a Cambridge professor, pointed this out just the, the couple, last couple of days to us, that it's very interesting that we cannot actually be sure that this was the tomb or that it, that it wasn't the one in the Holy Sepulchre or somewhere else. Why is that so interesting? It's such a significant piece of evidence because every other religious leader, we know where they were buried because everyone goes to the tomb to, to be by their body. But no one in the early centuries bothered about where the tomb was because they knew that Jesus wasn't there. They knew that Jesus was risen. Who cared about where he'd been? So it was, about, it was over 300 years later before people started to think about where the tomb might have been. And that's so significant for us. Because what does it mean? For me, I was an atheist. And I encountered Jesus. I looked at the evidence. I was from a lawyer, a lawyer background. I wanted to know what the evidence... I wanted to know, was it true? And when I realized it was true, I put my trust in Jesus. And that radically changed my life. I encountered myself, along with those 2,400 million people, the risen Jesus, just as anybody here, anyone watching this online, you too today, wherever you are in the world, can encounter the risen Jesus today. Because he's not here, he is risen. He is alive and he is here present by his spirit. And this is the even more amazing thing. His spirit is now living within us. And Jesus' message was, go, go out into all the world and tell the world, and I'm going to be with you as you go out and tell the world. And that's what we're all trying to do. And this is the exciting thing I think about today particularly, because today is 10 years to go before the 2000th anniversary of the resurrection. 17th of April, 2033, will be the 2000th anniversary. And wouldn't it be amazing if everyone on the planet had had an opportunity to hear about Jesus by then? Yeah, it would. How could that happen? It happens by all of us coming together and saying, Let's do this together. So, the Bible translators are working to get the New Testament into every, well, 99.996% of the languages in the world. And every language will have 25 chapters in the New Testament. Rick Warren is working on a Bible, a believer, and a body of Christ in every community. Catholic organization. There's some organizations here working on the 2033 vision. We at Alpha, we want to play our part. We want to try and make Alpha available to everyone on the planet by 2033. And we're working on that. But the point is this. We want everyone on the planet. The most loving thing. What's what I worked out after I encountered Jesus? And he changed my life. The most loving thing that I could do with my life is to spend the rest of it telling people the good news about Jesus. Because, yeah, but because the good news is amazing. Jesus lives. 
He's alive and his spirit lives in you. As you ask his spirit to come into you, he lives in you. And the one who lives in you will raise you from the dead. It's not just that this tomb's empty. Your tomb will be empty. Because when you're buried, God will raise you to new and eternal life. And what does that say? It says that the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection has changed our world. But it's also very personal. One day, he will raise you. Every atom of your being, every fiber of your DNA will be raised to life. And that means that your life now has, is full of meaning and purpose. And it also means that God can take the most difficult moments in your life and turn them around through the resurrection. And it means that all you have to do is put your trust in Jesus. And that's what I want to give anyone here who wants to do that today an opportunity to do right now. May we pray. I encourage you, if you would like today to be sure that you really have trusted Jesus personally and that the Holy Spirit really is living within you, his spirit, the spirit of Jesus comes to live within us and sends us out into the world. If you want to be sure, here's a prayer which you can pray. Just say in the silence of your heart, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you died for me and, were ra- and, were, and that you were raised to life the first Easter day. Thank you that you're here now. And right now, I want to turn from everything that I know is wrong. And I want to put my trust in you and what you did on the cross for me and in your resurrection. And I ask you today to come and live within me by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. His blood poured out for us the way of every curse upon him.
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. pray together. Father God, creator and king over the heavens and the earth, we want to thank, praise, and worship you for the day today that you have made. We are so grateful that we can celebrate this special day, remembering that you sent your son Jesus among us so that we can know you, have our sins forgiven, and experience a new life in him. Thank you that we can celebrate a risen Lord and Savior. We ask that we might grow day by day in our love, knowledge, and service of him. For those who don't yet know Jesus as Savior, we pray that your Holy Spirit would give light and revelation and that they would come to know his forgiveness and risen life and power in their lives and become servants of the Lord. We also pray for those who have walked with you in the past, but have wandered away or explored different paths. Lord, please call them back to return to you and your ways. Now, Father, as we are able to celebrate Easter freely together today, we ask that you would strengthen and encourage our brothers and sisters who are not able to meet together so freely. We pray for those in lands where they are unable to worship together or share the gospel. And we pray for those who are in prison because they are believers in Jesus, that you would provide for and protect them and their families day by day. We also pray for those who are unable to celebrate because of grief or disaster, conflict and hatred, where families are separated or struggling to survive homes have been destroyed, and where there is danger and fear within communities. Father, may your peace prevail in their hearts, minds, and lives, and may you provide for their needs, both spiritual and practical, day by day. Finally, Father, as the psalmist tells us, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, this amazing city chosen especially by you, 
where your love and your compassion was shown to so many, where Jesus walked and taught, was celebrated, crucified, buried, and resurrected from the dead, where there has been and continues to be much conflict, bloodshed, and heartache. We pray that the Lord of all peace would move across this city, bringing light and reconciliation to all who live and work here. And we look forward to that day when Jesus returns, placing his feet again on the Mount of Olives, and the kingdom of God will be established and all things made new. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. joy to be here with you this morning and to celebrate. We want to do one more song of celebration before we close today. This is a song of rejoicing. This is a happy day. But guys, you can clap and sing and dance. We can rejoice today. Here we go.
Take that joy with you out on the streets of Jerusalem and through to the world. Know God's blessing. Know God's love you. Know God forgives you and know God has risen for you. There's no place you can go where God has not been to find you and to bring you home rejoicing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to make our way in an orderly way, but quickly way, just out the exit where you came in. And we thank you so much for joining with our celebration today. Every blessing on you. And see you again next year in Jerusalem. Amen. Glimpses of you burn in my eyes. The worship of heaven fills up the sky.